Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and it's time for a retro review where we look at some old stuff like it is new. And the other day I was visiting my mom's house and it turns out she still had her original iPhone. She upgraded from this back in 2010 but hasn't used it since. And it's kind of like a little time capsule because it's exactly where she left it when she upgraded, I think, to the iPhone 4 back then. So I thought we would take a look at this phone and see how it works and how it might compare to today's phones. And it's certainly a lot smaller, as you can see here. And I also found some other iPhone memorabilia, including the bag and the original box. And this was from the iPhone that I bought on its release date in 2007. Can you believe it's been 16 years already? And there are some kids who are using iPhones that weren't even born when the first one came out, and that's pretty crazy. So we're gonna take a look at this phone in just a second, but as always, I like to do my full disclosures. Everything you're about to see in this review was purchased with either my mom's funds or my funds. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and take a step down iPhone memory lane. So let's take a look at some of the packaging here. This bag was what you walked out of the Apple store with on release night when you bought the phone. And I bought the phone on the very first day, June 29th, 2007. I've got the receipts here to prove it. This is my actual receipt from 16 years ago. I paid $677.29, according to the receipt here, after tax. And I also had to switch my service from Verizon, which I was very happy with, to AT&T, because AT&T was the exclusive provider. And the box and the bag here are from release night, but I sold my original phone on eBay years ago. But my mother's phone here is still an original, even though it's a few months newer than the, the release night phones were. Now, you got this huge box, and I'll give you the overhead view here so you can take a look at it. And inside you had, of course, Apple's signature packaging. And back then they included a lot more with your phone. So in addition to getting the phone, you got a charger. They actually have a little docking thing that you would connect to it. I think it came with that. And then of course you had your instruction sheets. They also gave you some headphones in the box. The iPhone has a headphone jack on it but you couldn't just plug any pair of headphones in because the jack is recessed a bit and most headphones wouldn't reach down far enough. So you had to buy an adapter even though it had a headphone jack to plug headphones into it. Here you've got your SIM card slot and then you have your power button along with your volume control and the silent switch here. And this switch was on every iPhone up until the 15's release just recently. And then, of course, on the bottom, you had the iPod docking connector, that 30-pin connector, which was later replaced by Lightning and, of course, now is replaced by the USB Type-C port. I was surprised by how great condition this phone is in. And as I mentioned, it's kind of like a little um, time capsule. And speaking of little, what shocked me was just how small the phone is. We've been so conditioned with these new larger phones. I can't even fit my Pro Max here in the frame. Um, but you can see just how much more screen you get on your phones now. The whole front is a screen at this point, whereas before you had a big chunk of the display area eaten up by bezels here, as you can see. Now, I was able to get the phone connected to my Wi-Fi network, and surprisingly, a lot of stuff still works on this thing. So, for example, if we go into Google Maps, even though everything is really slow because it's an older phone, it actually still gets map data uh, from Google here, as you can see. Right now we're looking at New Haven, Connecticut, and I've got the satellite images. I'm guessing it's pretty much up to date. So this works just fine, which was really surprising. Another thing that surprised me was that the App Store is still getting data from Apple, even though you can't install any of the apps anymore because they're written for much later versions of iOS. This is running iPhone OS 3.1, so it is a couple of versions ahead of the shipping version, which didn't even have an app store at all. But as you can see here for the top free apps, we've got Timu, which of course didn't exist at the time this phone was last turned on, along with ChatGPT and others here. And this is the top 25, but even the featured section here will put apps up for us to look at. But again, we can't install anything on here. Now, of course, when the phone first shipped, there was no app store at all. Apple envisioned that the phone would run web apps that you would install with little shortcuts on the springboard here. And of course, Apple changed their mind later and developed a whole set of 
development tools just for the iPhone platform so you could download other things to the phone. And it was a good thing they decided to do that because that's, of course, a multi-billion dollar business on top of everything else that they're doing there. But initially, all you had was the basics like notes and mail and the phone and the web browser. YouTube had its own app that Apple developed for the phone. And this does not work, unfortunately, although it does load up the menu here. If I go to any of the options, everything just kind of times out because, of course, YouTube has changed quite a bit since the app was initially released. So uh, a lot of stuff here doesn't work, but it's kind of fun to see how it used to at one point in time. Let's back out of here again. We can take a look at my mom's email. She just has a bunch of junk mail in here. And this is all going back to August of 2010 when she upgraded the phone. And as you can see, things aren't all that bad. It's a little on the slow side, obviously. Uh, we're going to see a lot of broken links here on these emails because the images that were being served are long since gone. Now, I did find an email from Knitting Daily that did work. So let's click on that real quick. And you can see the images are still here. Let me give you the overhead on that. And you can, of course, do the pinch to zoom. You could tap on text and have it kind of appear in the window here. So a lot of the things that we've grown accustomed to in the interface really began with this first iteration. As you can see, there are some crashes that happen. This was actually a very frequent experience on the iPhone, especially in its early days. You'd easily overload its meager amounts of memory and have things kick out on you, but uh, you would often have to just go back in and reload to bring those things back. So, you know, this is what it was like uh, back in the early days here. And you can see just how long it takes for those emails to render in from scratch. It does, did have a little bit of a cache there, as you saw before, which loaded things quicker. I wasn't able to do much with the web browser, primarily because so much of the web has changed. I was able to go to Apple's website here and get a little bit of the page, but not much of it. So it's uh, definitely not something you're going to use to browse the modern web because this web browser is way out of date. And I think some of the means in which websites are secured have changed as well since 2010 when this was last updated. But this is a good in, you know, kind of example of how long it took to even pull up a web page on the phone. It was not quick, even over Wi-Fi. And when you were on the 2G network, it was almost unusable unless you were visiting a mobile site. So it would do its best to render the page as it would look on a desktop PC. And back then, it actually did a really good job of it. But it was very, very slow, as you can see here. So not the best experience in 2023. But back in 2007, it was pretty groundbreaking. Now, for a lot of the built-in apps, Apple's design philosophy was something called skeuomorphism, where things looked like their physical versions. So on the Notes app here, you can see it looks like a notepad. You've got kind of a cursive font. They have some of the pages kind of torn away to kind of give it that notepad kind of look. It also had a voice memo function, very similar to what you know today. Uh, but that, of course, would give you a microphone with a little VU meter that would light up here or move as you spoke. Um, so a lot of these apps just kind of looked old in the sense that they were trying to give users an idea as to what it was you were supposed to be doing with that app. And of course, when they updated iOS a number of years ago, they got rid of all of the skeuomorphic design and went with something much more modern. Now, the iPhone did have a camera on board, a very tiny one, as you can see here. The image quality was terrible on it. It took very slow pictures. You can see how long it took to get that picture saved into the camera roll there. And it was almost like an afterthought. It didn't do video. There, of course, wasn't any front-facing camera. We didn't see those until the iPhone uh, 4 came out. But they had some cool features that I think were a bit of a game changer. So for example, you could attach photos to emails. You could have the share button here, send the photo to uh, the email application. So I could hit this and it would go out and load up the mail application and kind of drop it in. It had so many cool animations that made you feel like you were using something uh, new and exciting. And so it was kind of a fun uh, thing to have the camera even though it wasn't very good. As you can see, you can also jump into uh, the pictures here and pinch to zoom. What you could also do is rotate the phone here and it would give you a horizontal or vertical orientation. So that was kind of a new thing and you can of course uh, pinch to zoom here. And this is the kind of stuff the phone did really well and I think this was why people were kind of drawn to it initially because no other phone 
felt this fluid, even though it is a bit on the sluggish side, even though the data rates were terrible, even though the camera was bad, it just had a usability to it that felt amazing. And it was doing things that up until then, only a desktop computer could do. Its competitors on the market were nowhere near where this phone was upon its release. Google certainly caught up very quickly with them, but for a while, this was the hot ticket. Check this out. I'm gonna plug this into my Mac now and let's see if it recognizes it. Now, to my surprise, the phone is recognized and accessible to me on the latest version of Mac OS. And as you can see here, there's an update available for it. Back then, there were no over-the-air updates on this OG iPhone. You had to plug it into your computer with the docking connector and run those updates on the computer. And that was true of everything else that you would do with the phone, including music and movies and TV shows and podcasts. All of that stuff had to get synced up. Your photos did not go to the cloud for backup. You had to back it up yourself. There was a lot of maintenance involved with this phone. Even syncing your contacts wasn't going through iCloud just yet because iCloud really wasn't there yet. And to my surprise, I'm actually able to sync movies and music up to it. So right now, as you can see, it says sync in progress. If we go to my Mac here, you can see that it's copying over some music that I had on my iTunes account. And I'm also gonna see if I can get this four gigabyte movie to copy over as well. And I'm gonna let this go, this might take a while. And when it's done, I'll let you know if it all worked. Now that movie did not copy over, it said it was not compatible with the iPhone, but the music did make it over. And if I go into the iPod app here, you can see we've got the two albums that I copied over from my computer. These were on my iTunes account, which is why I was able to do it. And then if I rotate the screen here, you can see that you can get the album covers and then browse through the tracks here. And if I go back into this mode, I can then select the artist directly and get the same list here. So they had some neat features for browsing music, but I think it's just really cool that we can hook this up to a modern computer and still get data back and forth from the phone. Very cool stuff. Now, listening to that music was a little less convenient than today. You'd have to connect headphones directly to the headphone jack because although this had Bluetooth on board, it didn't support high fidelity audio over Bluetooth. It was only going to work with those little Bluetooth earpieces you'd stick in your ear for phone calls. So to listen to music, you'd have to plug in some headphones with the adapter at the top, or you'd have to find something that was compatible with the dock connector. But of course, you could play music directly through the speaker that was built into the phone. It didn't sound bad, uh, but of course, today's iPhones sound a lot better. Now, unfortunately, you're not making any calls on this phone, even though it has a a phone app on it. That's because no current US carrier supports this phone any longer. And of course, all of the internet-based phone apps like Skype no longer work on this old hardware either. But you can see what the phone app looked like here. And the biggest feature on the phone side that the iPhone introduced was something called visual voicemail. My mom still has messages in there, so I can't show them to you, but basically you'd get a list of messages that you could pick at random to listen to. And if that seems like a, not a big deal today, back then it was a groundbreaking feature because up until then you had to dial into your voicemail on the phone and then listen and go back and forth through messages using the keypad. And I remember I would have messages that I didn't want to delete because I wanted to have a reminder of people I had to call back and you'd have to navigate through all the saved messages and keep them in your mailbox so they wouldn't get deleted. There was a limit to how many you could store. It was not a fun experience. And one of the things that Apple pushed for when they were developing the iPhone was for the carriers to work with them to create this visual voicemail concept where your voicemails looked a lot like email. And of course, that is now how voicemail works on just about every phone you'll purchase these days. So all in, this was a pretty groundbreaking product. I remember when I bought this uh, and activated it, the following morning I went out to breakfast with a friend of mine at a diner and people were like all over us because they saw me with the phone and they wanted to see it and see how it worked. And although I don't think they sold too many on release night, because when I went to the Apple store like around seven or eight o'clock that evening, I just went right in and bought it. So there was a lot of curiosity about this device, not only the morning after I bought it, but for months afterward. Every time I was out somewhere and I took it out, I'd have people surrounding me wanting to talk about this. I was never so popular in my entire life. And it's funny these days, you know, there's really nothing that captures people's curiosity from a technology standpoint any longer. We've kind of seen it all. 
So I think, you know, whoever's making up devices these days needs to think about something really new and different because everything feels very iterative from what was started about 16 years ago, especially when it comes to smartphones. And when something like that comes out, we'll review it right here. That's going to do it for now. Hope you enjoyed this little look back at this little time capsule here. And until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Chris Allegretta, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Logic KGR, Tom Albrecht, and Amda Brown. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.